So we are joined by uh, Tom Coyne, our special guest today. He's a writer, a golf writer and professor at St. Joseph's University. Um, he's written A Gentleman's Game, which was made into a, a movie starring Gary Sinise. He wrote Paper Tiger, um, kind of about your journey into the world of professional golf. Um, you wrote A Course Called Ireland, A Course Called Scotland. Uh, your new book, A Course Called America, is coming out in May, correct? That's right. Yeah, May, May 24th. Available for pre-order now. I might pre-order it before you get me off of here. We'll um, do it. Yeah, we'll get it done before we finish the podcast. First we'll of all, pre thank you. Up. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate you taking the time. I know I know you're busy. You, you do a lot of these, and and we certainly appreciate you, you doing this with us. Oh, no, I appreciate you asking me, and uh, it's cool. I like what you guys are doing, so I'm glad to be here. So you're a, you're a New York Times bestselling author. You write for Golfer's Journal. You've written for Golf Magazine, Golf Week, Sports Illustrated. You played in Ireland. You played in Scotland. You've played U.S. Open venues all across the country. What, what got you into golf, and why, why, are, you, why are you still doing this? What, what inspires you to do all this stuff? Yeah, so, I mean, I started when I was, when I was pretty young. I grew up in a golf family. My dad played, my brother played, um, and, but I was initially like pretty reluctant to get into golf because it was, my brother was a pretty good player and it just looked kind of boring and sort of a grown up game, an old man's game. And, uh, I, I wasn't, I wasn't that into it. And at some point though, I, I gave in pretty easily, I guess around age nine, 10, um, I went to the junior clinic and uh you know i got the bug that that uh you know when it gets its teeth into you you know the feeling it's it's you know i i wanted to that idea of you know i i got to get better i can get better um you know just getting a little better every week and then getting to the point where you want to be better than your brother you want to be beat your dad or um you know, golf's a game, I have a little bit of an obsessive personality and golf's a good game for that because you can't, you know, because you can never really master it. You can't perfect it. Um, it gives you just enough success to where you think that you might be able to, but um, it, you know, pulls the football away, uh, as they say, um, often enough to, to kind of drive you crazy. So it's never been not interesting to me. Um, you know, I've had, I've, I've, found myself coming to golf from different directions. Now, you know, I pursued it in some books as a, as a player trying to play golf at the next level. And then I pursued it as a, as a traveler, um, trying to find the secret to golf in Scotland or, or play Ireland as one giant golf course and those kinds of challenges. So what's been great about golf, you know, from that initial, just falling in love with the game itself is the way the places it's allowed me to go and the people that it's introduced me to you know, that's been, that's been amazing. Um, and, and that's, I think the, the game or the, the life that the game has beyond the game that's so compelling and, and makes it really a lifetime pursuit because it never gets boring meeting interesting people and it never gets boring going to beautiful places. And uh, it's continued to allow me to do that so that I've been able to match up. I'm very fortunate to match up the only two things I really know how to do, which is I know a little bit about how to write and a little bit about how to golf. So I, I'm, I'm real lucky that way. Go back to, to Paper Tiger for a little bit, which was one of, one of your first, first books about golf. I think you, you went from a, a 15 handicap to, to a plus handicap in that year. What was that, what was that year like for you, kind of diving in head first like that? Yeah, that was wild. I mean, that was, um, that was a big transition for me because my first book was a novel – where I got to sort of, you know, make up the story it was fiction and it was about a golf prodigy. And, uh, and it was fun to kind of imagine the life of a, someone who could just, just hit it, you know, who could just play. So with paper tiger, paper tiger, I wanted to try and live that life, actually do it myself, you know, um, give myself everything the pros had shrink trainer, equipment sponsor, coach, everything. Um, and do that every day. Uh, I think it was 540 something days in a row uh, that I played golf. Um, 
and, uh, and, you know, to see if I could play at the next level. So, I mean, I won't spoil the book for everyone, but you'll notice I'm not on the PGA tour. Um, you may have noticed that, uh, <laughs> but I got pretty good, you know, I, I mean, yeah, like you said, I, I, I shaved my handicap down. I mean, I was like a decent player when I was younger. So getting down to like a four or five wasn't terribly difficult. That just required a lot of playing, but then getting down, you know, to where you could actually keep it around par or under par. And then maybe even trying to do that in a tournament, which is like a whole different sport, uh, tournament golf. Um, it was, it was a humbling learning experience, but, um, but a great one. And, and I was really, again, fortunate to, to be able to, to be able to live that kind of life. And it's been amazing how that book, I mean, it was my second book. So the books sort of naturally, you know, your audience builds book to book and you, you generally, your last book is hopefully your best selling one. And that tends to be the case with me. So Paper Tiger was only my second book. So I didn't have a huge audience then, but it's so funny that, you know, that was, I was, uh, geez, that was 15 years ago. And, uh, and I still get email from people who are like, I'm doing it, you know, I'm quitting my job and I'm going for it. Or, you know, do you have any advice? Cause I, I'm going to do what you did in the book. And I'm like, man, did you finish the book? Um, this is not, you know, it doesn't, it probably doesn't turn out the way you'd like to. I promise it has a happy ending, but golf's hard, you know? Um, so it does have like a little cult following, uh, among people, especially I think among people who are interested about what life, like what it takes to play at the next level. Um, I think it resonates with, with people who have, have, have sort of dangled their toes out of over out, you know, into the, into those waters, if you will. And, uh, and they can relate to it. Tom, quick question for you. So quick background about myself. I caddy at the ocean course on Kiowa. Nice. And I have a, uh, how are you guys are? He, he is. I'm in, um, I'm in Lexington. We're, we're all from, from Lexington, Virginia. Not, not quite as well known as Kiowa. <laughs> yeah. I'm down in Charleston. So, uh, oh, Charleston. But, uh, oh, it's, it's, it's great. I've been down here 11 years now, but, um, uh, yeah, I work with a couple guys who are, you know, trying to get to that next level. They played high level division one golf. If you mm -hmm. had to tell them one thing, what would you, what would you say to them? <clears throat> Man, um, if they, if they played D1 golf, then the advice I give to most, most people would be kind of not very helpful to them, which is to, you know, get used to playing tournament golf. Because if they played D1 golf and they played a lot of four day events and, you know, that was the biggest thing for me was getting comfortable in my tournament skin. Um, getting comfortable in a four day tournament, getting comfortable playing for, you know, for, for your living. Um, that I always felt like an alien in those environments. And then you, but you see guys who walk around in that environment and they just look perfectly natural. And that to me, I could never get that. I could never fake that. So there was always that suspicion, that feeling like that I didn't belong. Um, the best players that I played with though, they, they sort of seem to have this kind of attitude or approach that um, I don't know if it's cockiness or in a good way where it felt like instead of like I'm there and I'm worried about being in people's way right mm -hmm. where they're walking around like they don't even see you <laughs> you know and like yeah you know and that's beautiful right to have that I don't, it's not I don't know if it's a chip on your shoulder or if it's just like you know you can play um, and, and I don't know if you teach that or if it comes through results or success, I think there's like, someone told me when I was doing paper tiger as well, like I thought good advice I got was like, if you want to be really good at this game, um, and play it, you know, at the next level, you're going to need to get a little bit dumber. And, and what they meant by that was to, because I was, man, again, I had a shrink, I had, uh, you know, I, I was doing all this stuff with my equipment. I was doing, I don't know, maybe a little bit of the sort of Bryson route, really trying to like think my way into good golf and plan and plot my way into being good. And, you know, there's some guys who told me, just like, dude, you just got to hit it, find it and make putts, you know? And, and if you can do that and keep it simple like that. Um, and man, don't you, you, you know, when you see DJ play or you see, um, there's so many players who are able to do that. I mean, Rory was talking about that recently about how DJ makes the game look so simple and effortless, almost like he's not hardly thinking at all. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, he's such an athlete, you know, he's, a, he's able to do that. But I thought basically the idea of like getting out of my head and just reducing it, making it a game again. And cause you know, rather, you know, uh, now they're, you know, not, you know, playing golf rather than playing golf swing, as they say. I was really into playing golf swing and um, and make a shitload of putts. Yeah, yeah. That's my, you know, <laughs> <laughs> everyone can drive and everyone can hit greens. Um, there's just guys who, who made – and it's not a lot more putts either, you know. So, um, yeah, make a bunch of putts. Yeah, I mean, that's just – from talking to my coworkers, it's just putting within 10 feet, really. And that's what they say. So I think it's a nail on the head right there. You know, money from that distance. And yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And then I guess there's another statistic. Yeah. It's the, it's the putting from t- within 10 feet. Um, ball striking from like 180 to 220. That was another area that, um, like I could look like everybody else, um, d- driver, maybe my wedges, I could fake that. And, you know, when you're on a putting green, you all look the same too. But with like a six iron in my hand, I was not dangerous at all. You know, I'm hoping, I'm hoping to hit the green. Um, and the guys who really end up making it are dangerous with a six iron in their hand. Um, I never got that, fell in love with my mid irons the way that, you know, because everyone talks, it's just wedges and putting anymore. But I think statistically, if someone, it was broken, I saw it broken down to where actually that's, that can be a pretty important um, statistic. So when you, you hear guys like, like Colin Morikawa talk about when he was in college, he, he was getting told by his coaches that his shot dispersion with a five iron is what, what the pros were with eight and nine irons. So he's not a, a, a physically overpowering person, but when you can hit a, a five iron to the, to your spots, just like somebody else can with a nine iron, that makes things a little bit easier on you. It's huge. That's absolutely huge. I mean, think about that turns every hole into a birdie hole, really, you know, it's awesome. So after, after paper tiger, you somehow convinced your wife to let you walk around the entire country of Ireland if you have any yeah. advice on how to how to talk your wife and letting you do that, we'll we'll gladly yeah. take that advice too. Um, you played all of Ireland's true links courses. Yeah. You almost got eaten by a few dogs. What what was that experience like? Just dropping everything, going to Ireland, and just walking around an entire country. Yeah, that was like you said. I probably get more questions about. Um, you know, with both the Scotland and the America, uh, Scotland, Ireland books, and definitely with the America books, I'll get the same questions. Uh, how'd you get away with it, you know, and still remain married? So um, I write about that more in the Scotland book and, and Allison's even more of a character in the America book as well. Um, I don't know. I think, you know, she, uh, it's, it's funny. You got It's kind of like where you, where you set the bar, right? Going into your, the bad husband bar, like going into your marriage. So like with, with Ireland, it was four months away walking around Ireland so that, you know, you do that and then you come back and you say, oh, I've got an idea for the next book. And Allison's bracing herself. I said, well, it's only going to be two months. I said, oh, okay. Because, you know, we did four last time. Then when I did, uh, the problem was, though, when we got to America, um, and I guess when I did Paper Tiger, that was a year and a half, right? So I, I kept making, the trips got shorter. Um, until I did the America book in 2019 and, and I was gone for eight months. Um, no, really, she's just incredibly wonderful and supportive and, uh, and, you know, and understands this is what I do for a living and, um, and that I've, you know, always sort of been wired this way to do these kind of crazy, unreasonable things. And, um, and that's just, you know, and I'm, I'm really blessed that she's a, uh, Allow me to do them for sure. So no, that was a crazy experience. I mean, I think back on walking around Ireland, uh, the idea was, you know, I'll play Ireland as one giant golf course. And um, when you play golf in Ireland, you don't take a golf cart, you, you walk so that I would walk the whole way around um, from course to course and do the whole thing on foot and, you know, try to play the world's greatest round of golf, which to me would be if I could play my way all the way around Ireland. Um, 
And I think it was. So yeah, it was, when I think about doing that now, um, and it wasn't that long ago, but it just feels like another life. Um, feels like almost like another person. Because now I have two wonderful kids and my life is a little more conventional. Uh, well, I guess it wasn't in 2019. But yeah, it's a funny thing. Like you, when you do these projects, um, you go from like these extremes of activity and um, with Ireland, like literal danger because <laughs> walking on those roads with buses flying by on those ancient medieval roads was, was a little bit hairy. Um, you go from living out of a backpack and then you come home and you got to write the book. So you sit at a desk for six months. So you go from never sitting down to uh, just sitting down for a while. So it's, I don't know. I, I kind of like, again, I guess it gets back to that obsessive thing where I like kind of going all in in one direction. And, and that's kind of what I do with the projects, like no holds barred, if you will. Give me, give me one, one course. My, my wife and I were actually, we had an, an Ireland vacation scheduled for last July that obviously got, got put on hold yeah. because of everything that's going on. We've got travel credit. We plan on going back at some point. One course, if I go to Ireland, what, what course do I have to play? Well, that's a tricky one. I mean, I have my favorite, which is a place called Carn in Belmullet, which is in County Mayo. It's up on the, about halfway up, well, sort of towards the Northwest of Ireland. Um, which to me is just the greatest golf setting and greatest people and just really one of my favorite places, golf or otherwise in the world. Um, pretty remote, not easy to get to, and it's definitely off the tourist track. But if you're going for your first time, I mean, what, what part of Ireland were you going on your trip before it got canceled? Uh, we oh. were Dublin, Cork, and Killarney is yeah. where we were supposed to be going. So I, I, know, I know the big one near Cork that, that I'm sure – most different. the old head we're gonna go down there like yep okay yeah uh which is awesome um visually just so incredibly stunning um you know the only knock on it is it's not a true Lynx golf course and you'd want to try to play an irish Lynx while you're there but in terms of um visual drama there's no probably no more beautiful golf course well that i've ever seen um great people there too and then kinsale is just a blast it's a it's a fun town and uh great food people don't think about going to ireland for the food but if you like seafood man ireland is a treat it's an island you know I like all food you like all food you'll be good so yeah if you're gonna that and that's the the route where that most people would take was to sort of migrate towards the southwest down to killarney um and the golf down there is extraordinary so if you've got you got one round down there um Gosh, you got Waterville, Tralee, Bally Bunny in that way. But there's one, don't, don't sleep on, on Dukes, which is on your way down on the Ring of Kerry, which on your trip you'll definitely do because everyone in the south that goes to the southwest drives the Ring of Kerry. And uh, Dukes is, is on your way down to Waterville. Um, super fun links, water, on all, water surrounding it on three sides. And uh, my favorite logo, it's got a little toad logo. So it's great for merch. Which matters. I haven't uh, haven't talked my wife into four months yet, but she did say I could play at least once while we were there. So yeah, once that's tough. I'll, I'll take it for now. But no, absolutely no. That's great. Um, yeah, but Duke's is good value too. So think about it. Um, after Ireland, you went to Scotland, played over a hundred courses. I've always I've talked about it on here a couple of times. If I could play. One course right now, it would be the old course of St. Andrews. Is yeah. is golf in Scotland everything that that I imagine it would be? I think you're right. I think you got that absolutely right. If I could be anywhere, um, well, I guess if I was on my own, I'd probably say Carn. But if I was there with my family, I'd say St. Andrews. Yeah, I mean, golf in Scotland is, uh, and particularly St. Andrews, um, the home of golf it's it's exactly that <laughs> you know when you pull into town and you find that the 18th green of the old course is in is the center of town you know it's amazing I mean, that, that was my cut like i first visited when i was in college and remembered like the bus pulling in and uh and i was like dude the golf course is right there like we're driving past the golf course like the, the buses there's people walking their dogs on the golf course you know so you've got the old 
the new, the Jubilee. So there's just golf holes forever all over St. Andrews. But it's also like a college town. It's got this wonderful university. Um, it's got history. It's got like ruins, all, you know, it's the castle to go check out. It's got good food. Um, it's the perfect town. Uh, and my, my wife, you know, isn't really a golfer. She wants to retire there, which I am not against. Um, so that's why I love St. Andrews so much. I mean, that of the things that I love about it, like, like golf might be like third on the list just because my family loves it so much. My girls have a bakery they love to go to and just, we have a lot of good memories there. Um, but yeah, you're right, man. If you could drop me anywhere, that setting of um, just the buzz and excitement around that property 24 hours a day. You know, it's like the torch. If there was an Olympic torch for golf, like that never ex was extinguished, it's that, it's St. Andrews, right? Because there's just always someone milling about um, just golf. It's just where golf, you can just kind of feel it or hear golf breathing there. It's, 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 it's cool, man. Yeah, I uh, don't know a whole lot about Scotland that, that doesn't have to do with golf. So I, I know everybody talks about the, all the, the rankings, the 100 best courses, the nicest courses, the Augustas and Pebble Beach and, and Pine Valley, but I'm sort of a history nerd. So that kind of thing stands out to me. At least I, I think I would go there if I, if I had the chance. Yeah, there's so much history there. And then you know, then you can go down to North Berwick, there's history there, go over to Presswick, there's great history there, there's, you know, that is one thing, like, um, Scottish golf versus Irish golf, um, for the history buffs and people who want to, like, follow in the footsteps of James Braid and old Tom and, and, you know, Robertson and all those guys, you know, it's all right there, you know, and you can just go walk around on it, and it's, it's just such a cool vibe, like, it's all accessible, like, all those courses you named, aside from Pebble Beach, like, can't go play any of them, right? Um, but Scottish clubs, the cool the thing I love about golf in Scotland and in Ireland, but this is really the case in Scotland where like the clubs themselves, like the Royal and ancient is exclusive, right? Like I can't, no one's ever going to ask me to join the Royal and ancient, but I can go play their golf course, right? I can go play the course. So that like, that's just the arrangement in Scotland is that like the clubs are exclusive, but the golf courses are not, you can, you know, they share them with the community or anyone who just wants to pay a greens fee so it's it's weird like so st andrews has five golf clubs attached to it carnoustie has a few you go to um you know there's other there's other places so you'll you'll come up to 18 and there'll be like six clubhouses <laughs> and those are all different clubs um because the course is open to anyone who wants to play it uh and that's i really like that arrangement right because it makes it like not an exclusive status kind of thing like the game itself is a people's game joining the belonging to the royal and ancient like yeah that's for a certain kind of person whatever that's great but the game itself should be for for everybody and and that's that's what i love about golf in, in scotland and in ireland where they're just happy to you show up with a credit card and go right to the first tee so it's, it's good your uh your your book coming out in may um a course called america played all the u.s open venues um, played a lot of other courses along the way. What's the, what's the biggest difference that you found just not, not just in that book, but your time playing golf before then, what's the biggest difference between playing golf in America than versus Ireland and Scotland? Yeah. I mean, a little bit, a, a little bit of it would be, you know, what I mentioned about like the exclusivity and the privacy notion, um, that we kind of take our best courses and, we decide they're great by how many people want to play them and can't, you know, by like exclusivity, like gives a course like kind of a notch up in people's estimation of how great it is, which is weird. Um, if you think about it, you're like, you're like Pine Valley is the best. Why? Because I'll never get to play it. You know, but by the way, Pine Valley kicks ass. It's, it's, it's <laughs> layout and architecture yeah. is ridiculous. And it deserves its, 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 all its praise and its ranking. But it, we just have a funny way, I think, um, in America of like giving value to um, keeping people off the course. And, and that would be the sort of opposite to, to golf in, in the UK was 
or in the British Isles, I should say, um, where it's, you know, a course is rated great because people have played it and they tell you it's great. So, so that I like. Um, there's also like a fun, uh, the game over there seems to me to be a little more, um, at the club level especially, more competitive. Um, and I guess that's maybe why, um, like you don't want to get in too many matches with Scottish and Irish golfers. Um, unless you're getting more strokes than you think you should get. Because, well, until they went to the universal handicapping system, at least, and we'll see what the impact of that is, um, their handicaps are really, really legit. Because they could only, well, again, up until the change, they could only post competition scores. They have a lot of competitions. So I noticed that, like, there were way more. Like, in my club, we have, like, member, 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 guest, and, like, one or two other things. And club championship, right? Um, but like a Scottish club, like there was a cup or a prize every week, it seemed like. Um, and so they're always playing for something. And so like they're grinders, total grinders. And you, and you'd see some of these swings and like, where some of the clubs in their bags and you'd just be like, dude, like, forget it. I'll, I'll, let's play for our houses, you know? Um, but don't because they'll, they'll take every, every dollar in your wallet, um, or Euro, if you will, pound, I guess yeah. now. Yeah. <laughs> um so yeah, they're tough. And uh and also the style of golf would be a huge difference. I mean, in the Ireland and Scotland books, I only go to Lynx courses. Um and I just fell in love with that kind of golf. And I think when you travel over there, you should play Lynx golf. I mean, they have some great Parkland courses too, but the best Parkland golf in the world is in America. It just is. Um it's Pine it's probably Pine Valley. Um as the best Parkland course in the world. Um, but if you want to play Lynx golf, uh, if you want to play on sandy soil, firm and fast, with the wind, play golf in the setting in which it was imagined, you know, that's, th that's what you get to do in the British Isles, which we've started to imitate here. I mean, I think like, you know, courses like Old MacDonald, um, Band and Dunes, um, you know, are, it's funny, even Wisconsin has some pretty good, um, even though it's landlocked, Nebraska has some pretty good linksy courses, though it's landlocked. So we have, we have in America, some of the elements of true links golf courses. Um, but do we have all of them? Probably old Mc, and old McDonald at Band of Dunes would probably be the only one. And I say that because it's a hundred percent fescue and, um, there aren't too many courses that in America, let's see. Gamble Sands and as far as I know, Gamble Sands and Old McDonald are the only courses that have that crunchy, wonderful grass, you know, you can feel it under your feet. That's why I love when you, you can just feel like when you're in Ireland or Scotland, the difference, that crunch, the, the, the way the turf feels under your feet. Um, we don't do it over here because it turns brown. Um, and the, you know, but like, you know, Bandon Dunes, Pacific Dunes, they're, or even like at Sand Valley, a lot of the Kaiser courses, are fescue throughout the course, but then not on the greens because they don't want to have, um, reluctant to, to have brown greens. Right. Um, cause they're a visitor golf course, you know, you don't pay all this money and show up and play brown greens. So I, I totally get that, you know, but if you're a purist and want to play all fescue, you got to go, well, go to Scotland. <laughs> I, um, uh just talking about courses here that have sort of tried to, to imitate that a little bit. I don't, I don't have a whole lot to whole lot of a comparison to some of the courses that you've played, but you did, you played, um, Ballyhack and Roanoke as, as, uh, the broken T two man with the golfer's journal. I actually I lived in Roanoke for a few years and got the chance to play there. Um, a couple of years ago, as far as I know, that's the only course that you and I have both played. What do you, what do you think of that course? I'll tell you, I came to like at first glance and first time around. Um, it's definitely a course you got to play more than once. Uh, the first time I went around, I was like, damn, there's some really unfair, difficult, wacky stuff out here. Um, it's a course that kind of asks you to go against your instincts. Um, but once I got that and accepted it and kind of had fun with it, Man, there are some just amazing golf holes out there. It's a real, it's it's a very adventurous experience, and I'll take that. Even though you know, as what I love about like a, a 
a true links golf course is um you know that hasn't been moved around by bulldozers or or had too much shaping or whatever is that there's just something you can kind of see in the landscape the way the land wants you to play and that sounds hokey but you can kind of see the golf shots that um that the lay of the land is is suggesting um and asking you to execute at a place like Ballyhack, you had to kind of, you saw that and then you're like, Ooh, that's not the play. I got to go way far left of where I thought I had to, you know? And uh, so it plays tricks on you in Lester George um, plays some tricks on you. And uh, I actually thought it was really fun. It's a crazy piece of property. It's wild how close it is to downtown Roanoke too. Like, cause I'd seen pictures of it and I thought, man, I've got to drive, you know, it's going to be miles and miles outside of town. And it's just like right down the street. And then we're in this like, you know, crazy fun park of a golf course. So it kind of sneaks up on you. It totally sneaks up on you when you're getting up there. And then as I think, you know, um, I'd say the only knock on is, is it's totally unwalkable. Um, yes, it is. <laughs> and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned kind of the creativity of it because I, that the, what that stood out to me the most, I, I actually, I played with somebody who was familiar with the course and I know you've talked in, in your books about how a lot of a lot of Ireland and Scotland courses if you if you don't play with a caddy sometimes you might not know which direction you're supposed to to hit your tee shot in and I can I, I vividly remember a, the par five at Ballyhack that that shares a, a green with another hole the guy mm -hmm. was playing with said just take your five iron hit it this way and oh, I said, right. yeah. I, said I, I don't even I don't see anything over there where am I hitting it to and he said just just trust me it'll it'll land down there and you'll be fine so it's it's funny courses like that. It's hard to figure that stuff out unless you've either played it before or you're playing with somebody who who knows what they're doing. I remember that shot exactly too. So they're so I think Lester did something right. You know, there's some yeah. There's there's stuff on there. You get some bad breaks or there's some shots on that course that if it doesn't go well for you, you're gonna get pissed off and curse the designer. But it's it's memorable. I can and and I and man, I'll take that in a golf course any day. Uh, yeah, and I know exactly that shot you're talking about too. And it was fun because we're like, oh, I can rip driver down to the left or I can hit a five iron and I'll actually be better off if I hit the five iron to the right. That's crazy. It was really cool. So, uh, Tom, uh, quick question for you. I know you're, you live in the greater Philadelphia area and I'm an advocate of public golf, municipal golf. What is your favorite public course in greater Philly? I'm glad you asked that because there's actually quite a story going on up here around um, Cobbs Creek. Uh, the Golfer's Journal just did a story on it um, on the uh, on their digital platform, so you can check that out. Um, so Cobbs Creek is uh, Hugh Wilson's only other design outside of Marion. So he did Marion, you know, the one-hit wonder. He just did Marion. Well, no, he did one more course. He did Cobbs Creek. And which is right down the road from Marion. And it was a public golf course was built. Um, you know, the city realized it needed, you know, turn of the century, um, 18th, to 19, I mean, 19th to 20th century. Um, said we need a place for, we have no public golf in Philadelphia and we need a spot. So um, they commissioned Wilson to, to do the golf course. But there's word that probably like Crump and Tillinghast and others might have might have chipped in their help as well. So historically really significant huge in like the African-American community, golf community. It was one of the first places um, black players could play. Um, had, you know, uh, some of the first black pro events. Uh, had an event where, um, one of the first events where like Arnold Palmer was paired with a black player, like integrating golf. So, you know, it's got all this history to it. And the layout is killer. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's just, it's phenomenal. The problem is, as a city golf course, it, you know, fell into disrepair, um, like major disrepair. So it's been leased to a, um, a, a, a charitable group, the Friends of Cobbs Creek. Um, they might have a different name now, but in any event, uh, the city gave them uh, the property to, to revitalize and do over. And so they have... Um, Jim Wagner, Gil Hans' partner, um, is drawn the plans, you know, res to restore the course. A big chunk of the course went missing at one point in like the 40s. The, you know, the army put an armory, put a base on it or something. Mm -hmm. So they lost some, some holes. 
but they're going to restore it back to, to the Wilson plan. Um, they're going to add, there's two courses there actually. Um, they're going to turn the other course into a nine holer then with a great driving range and a teaching center and a first tee and like an after school program for kids. And it's a really ambitious, awesome plan. So they're in the fundraising stage right now. So if you came to Philly, I'd say, Hey, you can't like, you have to play Cobbs Creek or we called it Slobs Creek. Cause it was always, you know, it was a place you like snuck on and you hopefully didn't get mugged. Um, it's in, it's in the city. Um, it's legit. And, uh, and I don't, my, one of my friends actually did get mugged. I'm not being, um, <laughs> okay. um, but one got during a high school match and he won his match without his wallet, but, um, what the hell? Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's authentic and the golfer's journal stories about it is actually really great. So I'm trying to help out and pitch into, you know, to get this thing, you know, however I can help. I don't have the millions that they need, but spreading awareness, it's, it's, you know, it's similar to what they did at East Lake. Um, you know, to, to revitalize a community through turning the golf course into, and their plan is, you know, to like a Beth page situation to turn it into a, um, a venue for a U.S. open or, um, you know, they plan the routing where they can borrow some holes from the nine hole course and create a championship routing. So I wouldn't play it now, but next time, give it a couple of years, you come and play. And in the meantime, play Jeffersonville uh, and outside the city, um, which is Donald Ross. And, uh, and is a blast. We had our we had a golfers journal event there this summer, and people loved it. I forgot how good it was because mm -hmm. it's one thing about the Philly scene. We have all this great golf, right? I mean, Pine Valley, Marion, Ronimick, whatever, Rolling Green, my sleeper pick for one of the best out there. Um, but our public scene sucks. Um, so, but Jeffersonville is a winner, and then now hopefully Cobb's Creek is is a big change. Um, adds you know. It would be huge if this if they can put this together. Gotcha. Yeah, I come across a lot of people at work just working at the Ocean Course, people from the greater Philadelphia area, and I can never get a straight answer about the best public golf. So That's not a good one. That's the thing. Yeah. <laughs> it was Cobbs, but man, like it just was in such in such bad shape, you know, un, almost unplayable. And it was a shame because you go around and be like, this golf hole is insane. But um there's no fairway and the green is mud, you know, so it's like hard to appreciate the architecture. Yeah. You don't have anything to hit your ball off. Yeah. The uh, municipal course in Charleston just went through a similar deal as you just spoke of with the city donated money and they raised a couple million. Uh, Dude, friends of I was just um, right now, I have a message in here from Brooke, Brooks Carpenter. Yeah. I worked yeah. with Brooks forever. Yeah. Yeah. He was just yeah. texting me because I played with him when I was doing my golf in America. When I was doing the book, I played the Muni, Save the Muni. And um, I played with Brooks. He had a blast. Great dude. Really good player as well. Yeah, he's a great player. Yeah, really good. Um, so, yeah. So, shout out to Brooks. And uh, with the Muni is awesome. It's great. Yeah, it's – I mean, they got the – they got a local guy, Mr. Troy Miller, to help out with it, which is – kind of cool to kind of I mean it, it opened the same time or as, as uh Yeaman's Hall and Country Club of Charleston so hmm. put some uh kind of Seth Rayner signature um uh design into that but is uh, it a uh it is not but a lot of his uh, the crew from the Country Club of Charleston and Yeaman's Hall helped out with the yeah. additional layout so right uh yeah, they try to they try to put some uh, um, Raider tendencies into it, but uh, yeah, it's great. Yeah, so uh, it's beautiful. Yeah, Brooke, the water I remember, and you know, it's mm -hmm. really. I thought it was, you know, what a great course to have as your as your Muni. It's awesome. Yeah, it opened up, opened back up about a month ago, and it's got a two month waiting list. So it's really it's it's, it's hopping. Yeah. Oh, that's great. What's just kind of jumping onto that? What's the, I'm, I'm sure you've played a lot of Muni courses. You've played open championship, U S open. What's, what's the biggest difference for somebody like me, if I go out and want to play a golf course, what's the biggest difference between somewhere like Cobbs Creek and Marion other than, <laughs> other than the condition of the course? Is it as simple as just the distance that the pros play from is the setup so much based on distance or is there, more to it um 
you know the th yeah the uh it's funny the the condition at some of the uh the municipal courses i played were would make it things a lot more difficult for the pros if they had to play um you know if they had had to play the u.s open courses i played um in those conditions because you get such great conditions that you know when you go to Aaron hills chambers bay um Marion, you know, I went to, to every existing uh, club to to host the U.S. Open because I figured that'd be a way to sort of explore the story of golf in America would be through the open venues. Because if I played all of them, then I would have played, I would have walked in the footsteps of pretty much anyone who really meant something to, to American golf, at least from a playing point of view and architectural point of view as well, probably. So, um and it was great for that because the you know the story of American golf sort of begins with around the time of the first U.S. Open, so that all gets to be in the book. But um, yeah, the difference between places like like that and and a Cobb's Creek, um, you know, they're they're pretty pretty vast, um, and it's really about conditioning. I, but what's cool is is that you can take, um, you know, the municipal course in Houston. Um, you can take Chambers Bay, you can, you know, Beth Page Black is a municipal golf course, you know, that we can still have these championships at municipal golf courses. I really like that the USGA makes an effort to do that, to play at Torrey Pines, um, which is a place where my dad learned to play when he was in the Navy. So, um, so there's still, you know, awesome municipal golf courses, a place like Montauk Downs out on the end of Long Island, which is a beast. You could have a US, if it wasn't so remote, you can have a U.S. Open there tomorrow. It's a, it's a real meaty golf course um, out there on the, on, the, on the tip of the Hamptons. So, um, yeah, I don't know if I answered your question, but um, there's uh, – it's not – it's not so much setup. I think it's uh, conditions, and, and the conditions the pros get typically are a little bit – might be a little better than, than what I saw at a lot of places. I'll, um, I'm going to remember that next, next time I chunk a, a chip shot, I'm, I'm blaming it on the conditions and telling That's myself it, right? that I would have done better somewhere else. Rory couldn't hit that shot either. Right. Tried a bad line. I got uh, one more question for you, and we've talked about it on here before a couple of times. Just you, you've got a lot more um, to go on with all the courses that you've played, but if you had one course – that you could play it one time and never get to see it again, what would that course be? And that next question, if you could only play one course again for the rest of your life, what would that course be? Might be the same course, might be different. I have no idea. All right. So wait, so the first one, I can play it and then never see it again. Yep. You only get to play it once. Man. Okay. I'm going to say, um, well, let, let me do the one I'll play for the rest of my life. Uh, Cyprus. Cyprus, because it's like obvious to say, yeah, you know, the top three ranked course in the world. But um, Cyprus would never, ever, ever get boring. And it's like three courses in one, you know. We've got coastal golf, like beach golf. Then you've got like a little bit of like sandy foresty golf. So you have this variety. It's sort of like three courses in one that, um, and it's a really nice walk too. You can, like, it doesn't crush you, but it's good exercise. You know, it's not like walking Beth Page Black or something. So yeah, Cypress would be the course to play for the rest of my life. Um, and then maybe Royal Melbourne for, cause that's, that, of the courses that I have to go explore and cross off my list. <clears throat> um, Australia, New Zealand are, are really um, what's left. So if I had a one, one time pass, it's going to be down there. I think that's a pretty good answer. I think so. <laughs> William, you got anything else? Uh, no, just, uh, Tom, next time you're out on the uh, Kiowa, love the loop for you, bud. <laughs> Dude, I want to get down there. I just did a story for um, the uh, – so they're a resort magazine, Legends magazine, like the Kiowa Group's resort magazine. Yeah, yeah. I write for them once in a while, so I just did a story 
about Pete Dye for um, leading up to the to the PGA. So mm-hmm. I might be down if yeah if things go well. Uh, might be down there for the PGA ish, and then we'll go play. We'll go play the Muni. Yeah, we'll, we'll play. Um, that's in the summer, so we'll go play Yemen's as a uh, as non-red. Those what are those um those non-resident yeah. deals. Yeah, the uh, the infamous summer membership. Summer membership, dude. I write about that in the book. That's the best thing going. Yeah, it's yeah, because think Country Club of Charleston has like a six year waiting list right now. So yeah, yeah, yeah Yemen's is a special place. Oh, Yemen's was 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 awesome. Really, really cool. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, guys. Wes, Will, it's been awesome. And uh, keep in touch. Maybe we'll peg it sometime. Cool. Thank you so much for joining us. I can't tell you how much we appreciate it. Uh, My pleasure, guys. Be well. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. See ya.